Since the dawn of American cinema, Hollywood has had a fascination with war. Americans traditionally love to fight. That's why Americans have never lost and will never lose a war. Propaganda movies helped build support for World War I and II. So much so that the Pentagon started giving the studios access to military bases, aircraft, ships and submarines, even to off-duty officers acting as extras in their free time. The Hollywood Pentagon love affair soon became official. The military even created a whole new division, the Film Liaison Unit, with offices at the Pentagon and in Los Angeles. The relationship between Hollywood and the Pentagon has been described as a mutual exploitation. General, welcome Mr. Stark. We're after military portrayal and thereafter our equipment. Multi-million dollar tour. Lessons for actors on how a military moves. You know, what would make the dialogue sound more real. Even down to making the uniforms look accurate. Most people these days, they're getting their information on who their army is from what they see on television. So that's, that's our mission here, to help filmmakers portray the army in an accurate or plausible manner. And it's to help recruiting. This marriage of interest has its compromises. In exchange for support, the Pentagon gets access to scripts and, by contract, can ask for changes. If you're willing to play ball and allow the changes that they want you to make, you get this stuff basically for free. You have to pay for the fuel if there's a jet flying around. We actually have a menu of this type of a helicopter. It costs this many thousands of dollars per hour, and they need to reimburse the taxpayer for that expense. But it's much cheaper to borrow the military's tanks than it would be to, you know, buy your own tank. After the film is completed, the admirals and generals will review it before it's released to the general public with their thanks to the Pentagon for its cooperation in all the various branches. Phil Strube is the, really the, the head of the whole operation. He uh, is often thanked in movies, so if you were to go to IMDB and type in his name, Phil Strube, you'll see all the movies that he's worked on. But the Pentagon can also say thanks, but no thanks. Films like Platoon or Apocalypse Now showing the dirty face of the Vietnam War were denied support. For some of those Vietnam era pictures, every time soldiers and Marines went out into the field, they murdered officers, massacred civilians, they took drugs. And I think that the feeling was that, that wasn't quite an accurate portrayal. So is the true face of war what the military's film unit is after? We are looking for a reasonably realistic portrayal of military people, does that translate to positive portrayal? And, and the answer to that is somewhat. After many pictures of veterans coming home damaged by the Vietnam War, Top Gun presented the perfect opportunity to rehabilitate the image of the military on the big screen. It was the most successful film mission accomplished. They shaped that picture top to bottom, made it just the way they want it, and they actually put recruiting booths inside the theaters so that after people saw the movie, they could join up. Recruitment took a huge spike up when that movie came out. And that's when they really realized, boy, this, this kind of thing really works. It's almost like subliminal advertising. Take a look at that DVD. Filmmakers hoping to get that kind of support now know what the military is looking for. We don't have any preconceived showstoppers. Sacrifice, dedication, loyalty to the unit, those are some of the most important values. Even defeat can be shown as long as the U.S. military still looks heroic, like in Black Hawk Down, featuring the bloody 1993 U.S. mission in Somalia. A film that could not have been made without the Pentagon's Black Hawk helicopters. To have a seat at the production table, the relationship has now become even more open, allowing for some creative license. I am Optimus Prime. When you're fighting alien robots, realism's out the window. I think the only thing that's really taboo would be if the military was portrayed as a force for evil and this behavior was tolerated. There are consequences to their bad behavior. Full metal jacket. So shooting a civilian, 
issuing illegal orders, torture. You cannot show that on screen unless you also show that that person was punished. That's all we ask for. Is that really all the Pentagon asks for? I looked at tens of thousands of pages of correspondence between the producers and the military over script changes. And it's really shocking uh, the amount of uh, control that they try to exert. This is what lays out that it has to be you know, beneficial to uh, recruitment and retention of personnel. Take Wind Talkers, a film about the Navajo Indians used by the U.S. military as code talkers in World War II because the Japanese couldn't translate their language. The film did get Pentagon support, but only under clear conditions. The Pentagon said, no, we won't show soldiers being ordered to shoot other soldiers, and besides, it never even happened. Well, it did happen. The way they compromised was that they hinted at that in the movie. Under no circumstances can you allow your code talker to fall into enemy hands. The actual order to kill them is never presented on screen. Your mission is to protect the code at all costs. You understand me? So that's how they got around that. In other cases, there was no way around it. 13 Days, a Kevin Costner production about the 1962 missile crisis, shows belligerent generals trying to push President Kennedy to go to war with Cuba. My boys will get those red bastards. The film was denied support, even if Kennedy's taping system proves the story to be true. They don't want to be seen as the ones who would have caused World War III. Uh, so the, the producers had to go to the Philippines and they had to rent jet airplanes of that era that didn't fly anymore, but they just had to drag them around on the tarmac behind uh, tractors and then use computer-generated imaging to make them look like they're flying. Fortunately, they stuck to their guns. It would have been an insult to history. The Hurt Locker is an interesting case. Initially, the military was going to give them support, and then at the last minute, the military pulled out. Oh, get back! Get out! Get back! The liaison officer who was going to go and observe the filming learned that before he got there, some scenes had been filmed, he alleges, that were not in the approved script. And that insinuated a war crime, that a detainee would be shot by the military. And that's one of those red lines for the military. Since military equipment is paid for by the taxpayers, some argue the government shouldn't give or deny access to it just based on a film's message. The mission of the Department of Defense is to defend the nation, not to make films. So we're under no obligation. That's not our mission. Well, that might be fine if it weren't for the First Amendment. <laughs> well, I haven't noticed anything in the U.S. Constitution that requires the Department of Defense to provide support to any filmmaker who comes along. The government cannot favor speech that it likes and not give the same benefits to speech that it doesn't like. The Supreme Court ruled in 1995 that discrimination against speech because of its message is presumed to be unconstitutional. The government offends the First Amendment when it imposes financial burdens on certain speakers based on the content of their expression. This is exactly what the Pentagon is doing. So is this marriage of convenience legitimate and good for films after all? Damn it, we got a unit under fire! When you're working with the government looking over your shoulder, are we really seeing the, what the writer would have written without that censor? I don't think so. Hollywood must be one of the most intrusion-proof institutions in the galaxy. If they don't like our input, our technical advice, they'll be the first people to say, you know what, no thanks. Many successful independent films are indeed made without support, but sometimes at high cost. Filmmakers are free to decide, lose their independence, or lose a lot of money. Hollywood likes it this, the way it is now because it's much cheaper. The big loser in all this is the audience. What you're getting is sort of steady drip, 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 drip of propaganda being put into American films. And over the years, I believe that the real danger of this is that it's made the American people more warlike.